Hello and welcome to Sunday School Lesson number 40. Today we'll be talking about the preaching of the Gospel. We'll see what that entails and who is expected to preach the Gospel. Let us pray. Father Lord, we thank you for this opportunity yet again to learn. We pray that you will teach us yourself and help us to see our roles as individuals in preaching the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we'll be talking about preaching the gospel. Our text is taken from Mark 16 verses 15 to 20. Mark 16, 15 to 20, and it says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then, after the Lord has spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs. Amen. Shortly after Jesus Christ was baptized, he went about preaching the gospel. And this can be seen, we can see the demonstration in Mark 1, 9-14. Mark chapter 1, 9-14. It's a very cryptic, short description of the takeoff of the ministry of Jesus Christ. In verse 9 it says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting, and the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So his ministry kicked off with baptism. He went to John the Baptist, he was baptized, and there and then, God the Father confirmed his ministry with the Holy Spirit being there presently. The Gospel writer Mark continued in verse 12. It says, Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. It was a quick, rapid succession thing. He was baptized, he was tempted, and by verse 14, the Gospel writer is describing the ministry of Jesus Christ. He said, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the Gospel of the Kingdom of God. So in short six verses, Mark describes the takeoff of this ministry, from his baptism to his temptation and then to his preaching the Gospel. And I hope we can take a cue from this because uh, that shows that preaching the gospel was central to the ministry of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at the memory verse, which is from 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16. It says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. That's the King James Version. Just for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. The New Living Translation puts it this way. It says, Yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. In other words, preaching the gospel is not something that we boast about. It's not something that is extra. It is what we expect us to do. As a matter of fact, anyone who does not preach should feel terrible. Paul even called war unto himself. He cursed himself if he didn't preach the gospel. So you can see how seriously Apostle Paul took his responsibility as for preaching the gospel. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and towards the end, we saw the beginning of the ministry as described by by Mark, it was quick, straight to the point, 
baptism, temptation, and then he started preaching. And at the end of his ministry, as recorded in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, this, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So at the end of his ministry, Jesus having spent a lot of time teaching, preaching, healing, he commissioned his disciples to carry on the work. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And as many of us as claim to be disciples of Jesus Christ, we have been given that commission. So preaching of the gospel is a necessity. Preaching of the gospel is a commandment that Jesus Christ gave us. Preaching of, his, of the gospel is the last instruction that Jesus Christ gave to us. And he expects us to carry out that instruction. It's like a father you know, going out to work and giving instructions to his children. You clean the car, you clean the house, you do this and that. When the father returns, he expects those instructions to have been carried out. So we too are expected to preach the gospel because that was the commandment that Jesus Christ gave us at his departure. So today we're going to look at two lesson outlines. The first outline talks about preaching the gospel being a must for believers. It's not something optional. It's not something that we choose whether we want to do or not. It's a requirement. It's a must for believers. It's a necessity. There's a necessity for the gospel and there are requirements for the assignment. And in the second outline, we'll just look at the message. It's a very, very simple message indeed that we've been called to share. So first of all, preaching the gospel is a necessity. Why do we need to preach the gospel? Because it's a commandment that Jesus gave us. We just read that in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. He says, go therefore. He said, he didn't say if, it's, if convenient or if you like, or we have extra time. It was a direct instruction. Go therefore. So the Lord commanded all believers to preach the gospel. Why is the gospel a necessity? It is the power and the wisdom of God. First Corinthians 1 24 says, But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Why is that? Because Christ is who we preach. When we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, we actually preaching Christ. It's Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Failure to preach the gospel attracts a curse. We saw that in our memory verse. Apostle Paul curse, it is a woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. Failure to preach the gospel is a disobedience to a direct order. You wouldn't do that to your boss. You wouldn't do that to your earthly father. How would you do that to your heavenly father? He gave us a direct instruction. If we don't do it, that is an act of disobedience. As a matter of fact, preaching the gospel is a mandatory assignment, mandatory, uh, mandatory duty for all believers. Second Timothy 4 verse 2 says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exalt with all long suffering and teaching. In other words, we should be equipped. We should be ready. Whether you're assigned officially or not, you should be ever ready. The way you would not leave your house without a pen, not because you are a secretary or a note taker, but most people will not leave their houses without a pen. You will not carry a briefcase or a handbag without a pen, because you are ready. As you would not leave your house without a phone, said be ready, ready to preach. In season, out of season. Whether you had long notice or short notice, you should be ready. The word, the gospel should be in your mouth. At all times. Apostle Paul himself was ready in Acts 18 26. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Okay? So they were talking about a young disciple who was, who was uh, full of zeal but wasn't quite well trained, wasn't quite well taught in the world. So when they noticed his boldness and his zeal, they immediately began, they took him aside and taught him the word more accurately. 
It's a mandatory duty. Every one of us should be excited to preach the gospel. The gospel is the avenue through which God's word can be heard. It's the avenue through which souls can be saved. Second Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God wants all souls to be saved. And the way for them to be saved is for them to hear the gospel. There cannot be a change of heart if they have not heard, if they don't know the truth from a lie that is pervading the world. If we don't shine the light in their darkness, they will not know and they will not repent. So preaching the gospel is the avenue through this desire, through with this desire of God, his desire that no soul should perish. That's the only way to, to help fulfill that. First Timothy 2 4 says, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That is God's desire. That is his heartbeat. And we should be ready to partner with him, to cooperate with him, to ensure that his desire for all men to be saved must be fulfilled. And it says all men, doesn't matter where what their current state is. If they may currently be armed robbers or despised people or wicked people, God wants all men to be saved. And until all men are saved, we are still on active duty, required, expected to preach the gospel. Through preaching of the gospel, weary souls and sinners and those who would otherwise have perished come to know this God that we're talking about. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now that labor is not only the labor of work. There's labor in, in sin. There's labor in fear and torment. That's a burden. That's a yoke. People who are burdened, who are, who are weighed down by the, by the, by the trap, the, 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 the snare of sin and wickedness, they need rest as well. And we need to feel that burden as well, that these people are, are crying silently. They may not put it in words, but they don't enjoy the life that they're living. And we need to help bring the gospel to them. There was a prophecy about Jesus Christ in Isaiah 61, 1-3, and it was fulfilled during his earthly ministry. Isaiah 6, 1, 1, 2, 3 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirits of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. That was the, the, the assignment that was upon Jesus Christ. So the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. God sent Jesus Christ to do that. And in Luke chapter 4, if you read verses 17 to 21, we read the story. He went to the synagogue and they gave him this same passage to read. And as soon as he finished reading it by verse 21, he closed the book and said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your presence. Acts 10, 30, says how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with Holy Ghost and with power. And he went about doing good and healing those who were oppressed. He delivered those who were oppressed. So that's assignment. That job description that was on the Lord Jesus Christ is also upon us. He went about doing good, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, comforting the brokenhearted. I pray that we will all take up this mandate just as our Lord Jesus Christ took it up seriously and conscientiously in the mighty name of Jesus. In John 3, 36, says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. We don't want the wrath of God to be upon anyone. So we should help them by preaching to them so that they can have life and life everlasting. Praise the Lord. So Jesus is the gospel that we're talking about. He's the central message of the gospel. Any other message that does not have 
Jesus Christ front and center. It's not the gospel. It's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the central message that we preach. He's the one who is pleading with us to come. He says, come unto me. And we need to amplify that message. We need to take that message to the whole world that Jesus is calling. Yes, that's some Jesus is tenderly calling. Let us preach that. Let us send that message to the world. In 1 John 2, 1 to 2, it says, My little children, these things I write to you, that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for us only, but also for the whole world. <clears throat> so Jesus Christ is our advocate. He's the one pleading. He's the one tenderly calling us and also pleading with the Father. He's our advocate. He's speaking up on our behalf because he's the righteous one. And he has already sacrificed. That's why he says the propitiation for us. It's like the offering, the sacrifice for sin. And not just for the sin of a few, he has already paid the price for the sin of the whole world. Imagine organizing a party and preparing food for a thousand people and only 20 people show up. What a waste. Jesus Christ has already died. He's made provision for the remittance of the sins of the whole world. All seven plus billion, ten billion, it doesn't matter how many people. He's already provided for the salvation of the whole world. Why are we holding back? Let's extend that invitation and bring others into the fold. It is the blood that he shed on Calvary that cleanses us. First John 1 verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we should not be ashamed of the gospel. We must be ready always to preach that, that gospel. We saw that Paul's commitment in our memory verses, necessity is laid upon me to preach the gospel. Woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. In Romans 1 verse 16 says, <clears throat> for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jews first, also for the Greek. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel of salvation, and that should be central to whatever witnessing, evangelism, preaching we are doing. It should be all about Christ, his sacrifice, his provision for salvation of sins, because he does not want anyone to perish so what are the requirements now we understand that we have an assignment it's a commandment from god every believer is expected to carry out this assignment jesus christ himself carried this out while he was here on earth what do we need number one we need wisdom because it is wisdom that will help us navigate james 1 5 to 8 says if any of you lacks wisdom let him ask of god who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything for, from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So we need wisdom. And one of the lessons we're going to see later shows us how to approach different types of people. There are people who are skeptical. There are people who are mockers. There are people who are so filled with all kinds of vain philosophy. They can quote anything of writings of Confucius or this and that, but they try to trip you. We must be equipped. We must have the wisdom to be able to address every category of believer. So number one is that. And if you have the time, please read Acts 17, 15 to 34. Paul was in Athens, Greece, and that was the center of learning. And there were all kinds of philosophers there. They were propounding all kinds of theory. And through the wisdom of God, Paul was able to address them all. So that's the number one requirement. We need wisdom. Number two, we need compassion. We've got to feel that burden. Jesus Christ had compassion. In Matthew 9, 36 says, But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. He saw Jerusalem and he knew what would befall that city. He had compassion. In Matthew 23, 37 says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. 
How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So how do you feel when you see unbelievers, when you see people, you know, frolicking in sin and, you know, bad behavior? Do you feel angry? Do you feel superior? Or do you feel compassionate? Do you see through the eyes of Jesus Christ the kind of compassion he saw when he looked at the multitude, when he looked at Jerusalem? They were drowning. They were perishing and they didn't know it. Let's cultivate an attitude of compassion. Number three, we need, it. We need wisdom, we need compassion. We also need power. We cannot do these things by ourselves. Acts 1 verse 8 says, For you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We can't do this thing by ourselves. It takes the power of God to go out and preach the gospel. Acts 4.31 also talks about uh, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with wisdom. When the Spirit of God is with you, it doesn't matter whether you're standing before a president or a king, you will speak with boldness. We also saw that in the, the life of um, Paul and Silas in Acts 16.16-18. 16, 16 and now it happened as we went to prayer a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination made us, who brought her master's not profit by fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirits, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Initially, Paul restrained himself. But the power of God, the Holy Spirit in him, forced him to speak out and rebuke that demon, and that demon departed immediately. I pray that we will all develop or cultivate these three requirements, wisdom, compassion, and power of the Holy Spirit, so that we can be effective in this ministry. The second one friend talks about the message. It's a very, very simple message. Jesus is the center of the message. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When we preach, we are preaching Jesus. It's a very, very simple message about who God is, who Jesus Christ is. Number two, all souls belong to God. Black, white, Chinese, Indian, whatever. All souls belong to God. Ezekiel 6, 18, 4 says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul whose sins shall die. The soul of presidents belong to God. The soul of the area boy belongs to God. The soul of that man in prison belongs to God. The soul of Bill Gates belongs to God. All souls belong to God, and they are all precious in His sight. But guess what? All souls have sinned, even those of us who have come to know uh, God and accepted Him. We have, we say, our righteousness are like filthy rags. So all souls have sinned. You might think, oh, this one is an armed robber, this one is a mass murderer. But in one way or the other, we have all sinned. Romans 3 23 says, For well, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The good news, however, is that when we recognize that we have sinned and we confess our sins to God, He will have mercy on us. Proverbs 28 13 says, He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. So we've all sinned, but when we confess our sins, He forgives us. First John 1 8 10 tells us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, for His word is not in us. So let's recognize that all have sinned. And that's the message we should be preaching. Not a message of superiority, but a message that all humanity needs salvation. 
Because when we are saved, we receive the gift of God, the gift of eternal life. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And it's only the blood of Jesus Christ that can cleanse us permanently and completely from sin. You cannot keep going to the shrine to sacrifice this or that. No. Even in the Old Testament where the children of Israel were required to give this kind of offering, sacrifice a goat, sacrifice a cow and all that. They had to do it repeatedly. But there's one, one person who shed his blood and that became a permanent, complete and sufficient sacrifice for sin. Hebrews 9 verse 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, to cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The blood of Jesus is a perfect sacrifice, perfect atonement for, for, for sin. So it's a very simple message. Jesus Christ is the beginning and the ending. Jesus Christ is the, is the gospel. And the salvation that we need is only through Jesus Christ. God does not want anyone to perish. All souls belong to him and he wants every single person to be saved. The way to be saved is first of all to acknowledge our sinful nature, confess our sins, and then he cleanses us. He forgives us, gives us the gifts of eternal life. You've been equipped. I have been equipped. Because Jesus Christ says, he with greater things than he did, we will do. He saved, he healed, he preached. We can do it. John 14 verse 2 verse 12 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. So brothers and sisters, let's go out there and preach the gospel. That's what we've been commissioned to do. And the whole world is waiting for us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this lesson. We pray that you will stir our heart, you will revive our heart to take up this assignment seriously. This mandate you have given, given us, help us to take it seriously and go out to all the world, every occasion, every opportunity to preach the gospel. Please help us, Lord. Holy Spirit, help us, embolden us, and give us utterance even as we preach the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.